It's a pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Dinesh Babu Jayakobi, my colleague. He's a student professor here. He leads the multimodal perception lab. <coughs> His research interests are centered around audiovisual signal processing, machine learning, and uh, a very fast emerging area called social computing, which a lot of things he's going to talk about, uh, having bearing on the social computing aspect. Prior to this, he was a postdoc at the social computing lab, EDAP Research Institute at uh, Switzerland. It's also called EPFL. He was there for 2.5 years, following his PhD, um, which again he obtained from EPFL Switzerland at 2011. Prior to his uh, doctorate degree, he was a senior research engineer at Mercedes-Benz Research and Technology Division. Even now, there's a very strong R&D division in Mercedes-Benz, looking at a lot of uh, visual processing uh, algorithms related to automotive applications. He was there for three years. Prior to the position, he was, has a MSc engineering degree from IISC, Bangalore, in 2003, uh, in a stream called System Science and Signal Processing. Prior to his MSc, he has a BTEC from uh, Madras Institute of Technology, uh, in electronics. Uh, before uh, welcoming him, uh, I just want to add an informal note. A lot of things he's going to talk about uh, are not science. They are science fiction uh, being being made into science. Uh, they are they are su sufficiently advanced enough to really have a wow factor. Uh, I always give an example uh, of uh, Hollywood movies, particularly being ahead of our time. They are almost into the realm of science fiction, starting from the Space Odyssey movie of Arthur C. Clarke. And uh, even now, I don't know how many of you see movies, the Fast and Furious franchise, I always tell Gopi, uh, <clears throat> the Fast and Furious franchise has seven, eight franchises. One of them talks about the God's Eye. It's a software which uh, can t take inputs from all cameras all over the world, not necessarily surveillance cameras, from anything that at all, anywhere in the world and integrate it and you look you look, give any partial information about a person you want to locate it can locate him across the world and it's used in the movie to track a goodwill and kind of thing and uh, that's real science fiction even though it's already coming in hollywood movies a lot of things you're going to listen from uh, uh, dinesh today is uh, more of that kind and uh, it's not so much science fiction because dubai apparently the police use this kind of systems already in place and uh, so dinesh is leading this kind of activity very unique in this country and you'll see more of it. Rather than say Godspeed, I'll say God's eye to you. <laughs> so thanks, Professor. Uh, good to be introduced by you. Uh, and uh, thanks, everyone, for coming down. So uh, in terms of uh, today's talk, uh, there are going to be two main uh, parts. The first part, uh, I'm going to focus more on social uh, behavior and skills. Those are the key words. And then the second part, I'm going to focus more on uh, visual computing, vision, uh, machine learning, deep learning. So those are the keywords for the second part, right? So maybe depending on your schedule, you can come in, go, whatever, however you want. Uh, so let's start. So the multimodal perception uh, lab, uh, we are sort of having different applications uh, that are of interest to us. This is our primary interest, skill assessment and feedback. In terms of how we do it, uh, vision is sort of the primary modality we are interested in. We also collaborate with people working on speech and uh, text. And uh, so far, uh, uh, this part is uh, fairly uh, mature and few applications in uh, vision. These are mature. This is sort of into the future. Uh, even augmented reality is just uh, getting started, right? So that is sort of the overall uh, scheme of things. and. Uh, I'll talk about skill assessment and feedback to begin with. Uh, so I have to uh, take a step back and sort of uh, take you from uh, where it all started because uh, I've been here for four and a half years. Before this, I was a PhD postdoc from uh, EPFL, which Professor Ram mentioned. So the genesis of this work sort of starts there, uh, which is about social interaction analysis, which is a mix of social psychology and uh, computing, right? Um, so what social psychologists have uh, done extensive research is uh, they have looked at uh, various, uh, various constructs like emotions, traits, uh, relationships, expectations, right? Uh, expectations as in, say, a, a, a teacher expecting certain things from a good student, right? So there are various uh, constructs, right, which are perceived uh, type of constructs. And uh, they, uh, they have uh, studied these and said uh, verbal 
apart from the verbal communication non verbal communication plays a huge role in terms of how people uh, perceive and many a times uh, the expression and perception right how uh, somebody expresses this or how somebody perceives this happens very uh, automatically and unconsciously right so i, I put this without giving lot of detail because we have lot of ground to cover but i just say this uh, right away in the first place and uh, the people who have studied human communication right uh, what they have done is they have uh, manually uh, looked at uh, videos and frames right so you here you see 100 100 frames this is in time two people talking to each other right and somebody has looked at every frame and annotated uh, the eyes brows mouth uh, the micro activity that is happening and so on right so mouth eyes and so on so this is the uh, the effort that somebody has put in manually coding uh, some of these behaviors at every uh, frame right so now what do we have so that is where the social interaction modeling uh, area comes to picture right so this is what humans do they observe non verbal behavior uh, they express non verbal behavior right and then uh, they also perceive non verbal behavior maybe in interactions right and uh, social psychology has studied uh, the relation between some of the constructs right uh, how somebody is uh, what somebody's emotion is or how dominant they are and so on those are social constructs uh, they have tried to understand the relationship between the social constructs and uh, behavior using manually uh, extracted cues which is what we saw before right and some of these cues are called vocalic uh, voice related kinetic movement related and so on right what this field social interaction modeling tries to do is uh, if we can automate the cue extraction right whatever was happening manually if you can do it automatically using multimodal signal processing techniques various types of cues that we can talk about then we can start to think of individually predicting certain constructs like dominance say who is the most dominant person in a uh, interaction may say in a meeting or you can also think of uh, predicting how a group behaves maybe what is the conversational context or what is the leadership style like maybe somebody is a participative leader somebody is a uh, is a sort of a free rein leaves the group to do what they want or maybe somebody is an autocratic leader right so can you automatically predict give me a video of a interaction i will predict some of these things so that is a framework that we are looking at so i'll show a small uh, video where uh, we look at a interaction four people are interacting there's a camera here two cameras uh people are being tracked as in when somebody speaks you see this thing uh appearing the red the white uh box here and then their heads are tracked and then what is also put on top is uh what is their visual focus of attention whether it is a table which is t uh, or maybe a person one of these people which is a b c and d okay so now you will see that as time progresses their behavior is being tracked and it is summarized say in terms of how how much they talk a talks a lot compared to say c here uh, how much somebody interrupts say c interrupts the most uh, and then uh, what is the predicted visual focus of attention so received uh, focus of attention as in who receives the most attention and so on so this is in terms of summary of what is happening the behavior tracking and then finally a model which goes from here to here which is given that somebody has behaved in this way this group in this group uh, what is it that they are likely to be perceived as so here you see that the red person which is here uh, he is perceived as a dominant person in this group right so now let us look at a video okay yeah what do you mean by linear access like a video tape goes forward backwards ah. uh, fast and stuff yeah. yeah okay so special navigation linear access random access and the, maybe you can send it to me by email just to participant one So this uh, data set is part of an AMI corpus which was a, a European wide uh, project where they collected uh, data uh, as in uh, a set of four people uh, designing a remote control and uh, going through various steps and then finally uh, presenting their uh, remote control right that was the setting and uh, this gave lot of opportunities for various people to come together uh, people from speech from uh, vision uh, from social psychology uh, and so on right so various uh, various groups were involved in collecting this data and then studying uh, this data so this is uh, so this is finally uh, as you can see uh, this person uh, who is the red one he is uh, predicted Absolutely. as the most dominant from the model so
Yes? Sorry, uh, what does? Uh, so, what, 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 to what extent? Uh, the perception of a dominant behavior implies real dominance. Actually, whether they're actually dominant. Actually, they are dominant people. Actually, yeah. dominant. So, to give an example, uh, Gandhi, for example, had a huge follower. Right? And, uh, uh, he was not at all perceived as dominant. Correct. But he was uh, very. Correct, correct. But then he could dominate over, or rather, he could influence correct. a huge number of. Correct, correct. To what extent that the perception actually needs the cognition? Correct, correct. So, so, so dominance is a different construct. Influence is a different construct, right? So here, what we are talking about is a model for perceived dominance, and we only care about perceived dominance. Uh, let's not take this. I, I can even say Gandhi was able to uh, get his ideas dominated over others. Okay. Through the means of influence. Correct. Uh, so even if we don't consider influence, or even if we consider the exact definition of dominance. Correct. Does the perception of dominance imply actual dominance? So here we are not even uh, worried about actual dominance. Here we are only worried about a computational model of perceived dominance. That's it. So if a human perceives somebody as dominant, can machine perceive the same way? No, we are not claiming. Yeah. So these are perceived. No, no, no. No, no. This is a per perceptual model. Just like. Say if we see a photograph of somebody uh, smiling, uh, if a machine, if a human says that yeah they seem to be happy, here also we, we should say seem to be happy. That's it. What is going underneath, which is actually the realm of psychology, we are not touching. This is social psychology, which is only at the perceptual level. Okay. So yeah, thanks for the question. It clarifies the difference between psychology and social psychology. So broadly, this is our framework where we have the behavior being tracked, cue summarized, and then there is a model of how uh, somebody perceives a certain behavior, right? So that is the framework we are looking at. So let me first talk about the, uh, so all this is past, what are we doing here, right? So thanks to the SERB uh, project, we are looking at communication skill assessment. Uh, why communication skill assessment? Because it is, uh, it is related to the, uh, I mean, it is so important, uh, as you can imagine, be it at work or at uh, home. So that is point number one. Point number two is uh, for the same hard skill, right? Uh, soft skills help uh, people navigate their uh, career, right? So it plays a huge uh, role. And uh, the traditional setting uh, is the face-to-face -face setting. What we, are, uh, what we have been uh, looking at is what is called the asynchronous uh, video interview uh, type of setting. And uh, this is becoming a slowly popular way of uh, assessing people. I'll show you uh, uh, a page as well subsequently. Uh, and uh, the good thing with this setting is uh, you can do a very quick assessment, uh, speeds up selection process, which is assessment. We are also interested in uh, feedback, as in not just about uh, whom you could select out of, say, 1,000 resumes or 1,000 video uh, resumes, whom would you select, uh, say, top 10 or whatever. We also want to give feedback, which is about uh, helping uh, helping the uh, candidate improve also. So two kinds of work we are interested in. And uh, this is a, a commercial uh, hiring uh, company, HireView, right? Uh, where you have this uh, interview, uh, a question is being asked, and uh, the person answers, and then uh, people are being assessed, right? So this is uh, already in place. There are many such uh, uh, such way, I mean, such websites which do this assessment. Uh, what are we uh, trying to do? So what are what we are trying to do is uh, we are trying to look at this uh, uh, what do you say possible uh, settings where people can be assessed, right? Certain settings uh, like uh, video resumes or group discussions may not be uh, may, may not be actually uh, prepared or uh, produced from an assessment point of view. There is a subspace within this, uh, which is the assessment-oriented interaction, of which uh, the asynchronous video interview that we talked about, that is one such, uh, one such element here. Face-to-face -face, uh, face -face interviews is the other one, where it could be two people sitting uh, next to each other and one person interviewing the other. Right? The difference between these two, as you can see, is uh, here 
it is it is more social in nature as in uh, there is a person on the other side right whereas here there is no person on the other side uh, but then here you have this uh, possibility of scaling up as in you could do a uh, thousand interviews per day if you want right whereas here you need a uh, thousand interviewers you have to do thousand interviews so that's the uh, main difference as you can see uh, also uh, here you can actually do prompting as in you can ask specific questions so you can uh, get answers maybe in a video resume uh, you may not have such option people say what they want uh, right so so to begin with we wanted to study these two and uh, the fact that the avis are becoming very popular uh, we wanted to benchmark them with face to face interviews because this is more uh, traditional well uh, well understood type of setting uh, we wanted to understand this uh, particular setting the next we also uh, wanted to look at uh, the spoken types of uh, interactions right uh, interviewing whereas what happens if you have uh, say a written interview maybe there is a bandwidth restriction you can't stream videos uh, what happens in that case can we assess people uh, using uh, written uh, interviews or essays and do they are you able to assess as well as in uh, face to face interactions uh, are these as good as face to face interactions and so on uh, again uh, one more setting is uh, what if let's say uh, so if one of the complaint for this part is oh there is no person on the other side uh, we could also think of a face to face discussion where you have a peer uh, interaction with a peer which is like a group discussion uh, which happens in say uh, i am interviews and stuff like that right where you can assess if somebody is a good team player uh, or not uh, this is fairly scalable as in you can get peers easily whereas a interviewer might be little difficult to get right so there are various uh, various uh, settings we can look at in terms of uh, assessing uh, people right so what is our contribution our contribution is uh, we try to benchmark the interface uh, based interview which is a new uh, new thing that has come uh, and then we also uh, uh, subsequently uh, uh, benchmarked uh, interface based setting uh, with uh, written uh, written type of uh, 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 interviews right a written uh, interview as well as a written essay so written essay you can think of it as uh, what happens in gre tofl right so uh, this is uh, written essays so then we went on to look at uh, discussions dyadic uh, discussions and finally one uh, one more piece of work is uh, feedback prediction as in uh, yes okay we are, uh, we assess people can we also start to produce some uh, feedback which are meaningful to people so i'm going to talk about each of them uh, in detail so this is the last piece of uh, work so this work uh, which is titled uh, asynchronous video interviews versus uh, face to face interviews so what are we trying to do a same uh, candidate attends both uh, a face to face interview as well as a interface uh, based interview and uh, there are external observers right who perceive the performance and rate uh, rate candidates based on various attributes and this is the manual uh, rating right we wanted to see is there any difference in uh, perception uh, is there is it that one setting is better than the other in some sense right or uh, in terms of building a, a model which uh, takes these interview videos uh, and automatically extract features and then tries to predict the score uh, using a model can it uh, can we do uh, a similar uh, performance can we get a similar performance even in the case of interface based or asynchronous uh, interviews as compared to face to face right so that is the uh, problem setting and uh, we went ahead and collected uh, a data set of 106 uh, interviews where the same participant uh, sat for a face to face interview as well as uh, an interface based interview right they uh, so you go sit uh, record your uh, interview uh, you will be asked a question a behavioral question a hr uh, type of question uh, five questions appear one after the other you are given a certain time and you are uh, giving the uh, interview right so that is what is happening and finally uh, after all this uh, so we also managed to incorporate our model uh, into the cloud and said uh, okay so your uh, communication uh, skill is above average below average and so on right so this is the feedback part so that is the uh, data collection uh, part for the interface based similarly we also had uh, people uh, sitting for a interview with a interviewer so we had asked few people who actually take interviews hr interviews to participate in this so we collected 106 uh, such uh, interviews 
then we started to analyze analyze them so we had these external observers who uh, rate people in terms of various attributes one of which is what is of interest to us which is the effective communicator uh, attribute and we to begin with looked at the kappa which is which says how the inter annotator uh, agreement is which is very important because these are qualitative uh, measures so we did that uh, we found uh, the the kappa values were quite good for uh, many of the uh, attributes some wasn't but for uh, effective communicator it was uh, 0.8 some of these attributes are based on uh, existing uh, work uh, in this area we also looked at correlation of uh, effective uh, communicator with all these attributes right so we we found that certain variables are quite uh, correlated like uh, enthusiasm convincing facial expressions or fluency and so on right so these are good attributes uh, uh, here but then uh, what we are aiming to do is automatic prediction so these are still attributes somebody has labeled it right so what we uh, did was couple of experiments one to see if you just have attributes how well can you predict uh, the communication uh, level of a person so we defined what is called a, a below average uh, task which is to be able to predict uh, to put you, put people into two back, uh, buckets below average or uh, above this uh, so we found that uh, we could get quite good uh, accuracy in terms of attributes uh, 88 and 92% uh, so, so these were some of the main features that were showing up there uh but still these are uh, this this these are not at automated right so here is where we perform uh, the experiments with automatic fe features and cues and what we want is can we go close to these numbers right that's what we want and what we found was uh we found that uh in the interface based setting uh we were roughly getting uh, 79% uh, accuracy 80 close to 80 uh, even in the uh, case of face to face uh, we get around uh, 80 with just what are called the prosodic cues which which measure how somebody speaks right speech based uh, features these are uh, speaking activity based features uh, visual features lexical analysis features and so on so some of the uh, features are uh, detailed here uh, broadly the take home is uh, the rate of speech was one important uh, feature one important cue uh, prosodic features they turned out to be very important so in terms of uh say putting a model in the cloud and saying okay can we uh, predict uh, how somebody is doing uh, we can afford to do it because uh, prosodic cues are the best uh, visual cues you need lot of uh, computing uh, power to actually uh, put them there so here the good news is you can go with some low uh, low computational uh, features so that they can be used and still get uh, the best performance right so so that was the uh, sort of the main uh, conclusion yes sometimes it happens yes so it also depends on data so if you have a uh, really large data then these uh, what do you say these fluctuations might not happen but uh, at this point you can say either it is a uh, bad feature or uh, data size is uh, data size is small yeah course course features yeah correct for example somebody with uh, with autism you uh, know may be making very good points but uh, correct 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 yeah these are statistical models yes yes so these are statistical models uh, developed with some uh, data set so they they tend to work uh, within the data set uh, whenever you're taking out you have to be very careful yeah ट मैनुअली अपटेन्ड so we try to automate them uh, get started but we are open to looking at new features also because we have the uh, features with us so we can uh, compute so at the same time you go back and say this looks like a good model uh, are there studies which uh, say that it is actually true so we get a sort of a reinforcement yeah okay you can look at the behavioral difference when a person talks to another person versus when they talk to a camera correct 
Correct. Correct. So I think uh, one observation uh, we found was in terms of expressiveness. Uh, uh, so there were there were a set of people who became a little bit more expressive in the social setting. There were a set of people who were more expressive in this uh, interface uh, based setting. So I think there is some interesting thing going on. Maybe introvert, extrovert. There is uh, maybe people uh, behave differently in different settings. But yeah. Uh, so we were not able to make any conclusive statements on those, but there seems to be a difference for certain type of people. Maybe there is a personality dimension also, which has to be looked at. Yeah. Okay. So this was for the face-to-face uh, -face interview and uh, interface-based uh, setting. So then we uh, started to look at the written interface-based uh, interviews. As I said, the motivation is what if the bandwidth is low and so on? Can we look at uh, this setting, maybe a written interface based setting. Maybe here you might want to do some proctoring, maybe you want to see people, whereas in the previous case you could not, you could definitely see people, whereas here uh, you might just switch on the camera just to be sure, maybe once in a while ping a few images, right, just to be sure. Uh, written essay, of course this is well studied and well uh, understood in terms of uh, GRE TOEFL, so we wanted to see uh, what happens if you start uh, doing all this together, right. So, so again, the situation is somebody gives the assessment in all three uh, regimes, right? And uh, you want to see whether uh, the manual annotation matches uh, and the automatic prediction also matches. And uh, here I'm going to uh, go a little fast, given the previous stuff. Uh, so we had a platform with, with, which helped us to do that. Again, we looked at some of these attributes. Uh, so some of the attributes here, you see, uh, 0.95, which is ideas and content. Maybe it is, uh, so it is very related to effective communication, but then very hard to predict even this, right, ideas and uh, content. So you have to do a very deep analysis of uh, what is being uh, written and so on. But in terms of uh, automatic uh, results, we were roughly uh, getting uh, numbers uh, 0 0.75, 75% uh, accuracy in, in all these uh, three categories. So that's the main message. So in, in some sense, uh, we can say uh, that we can predict communication skill in all these uh, all these different settings, and it is comparable to uh, what happens in a face-to-face -face interview. Slightly less, but comparable. Uh, then we also uh, looked at the dyadic uh, setting, which I mentioned uh, some time back. So the challenge here was to uh, build a platform uh, where, uh, of course, you know Skype and uh, Hangout and all that. Uh, what we wanted was two people interacting and uh, we wanted to have a, a record of uh, record of the videos, right? Not only it should be streamed on uh, on both sides, but it, you also have to have a video recorded uh, uh, of both the interviews. And then we uh, also have to do some analysis of these uh, interactions, right? So uh, we did some uh, analysis. Of, of course, we did the analysis of, on communication skill here. Uh, as I told you, the important thing about this interaction is you, you can know whether somebody is a good team player or not, right? That is one important uh, thing about this setting, and it is also scalable. You can scale this up uh, fairly well, and we also can make some statements about at a dyadic level, uh, at a dyadic level, as in uh, did these people get along well, right? Those are some things which uh, we can tell here. Okay, then we went on to uh, look at uh, feedback prediction. So the goal here is, uh, so far we have done all these analysis of uh, uh, in interactions and so on, uh, interview. Uh, what was not coming out very well was, uh, in some sense, the notion of giving a actionable feedback, right? Say, for example, you say uh, you are above average, below average, or whatever, right? I mean, it's a little difficult for somebody to appreciate and uh, think of, okay, what can I do, right? So here we started to uh, pose the problem as, uh, give me a video, I'll tell you what ABC you have to do, right? You're doing this well, you're not doing this uh, well, and so on, right? So we just posed it as a, a prediction uh, problem, which is a uh, actionable feedback prediction, and uh, so once we've uh, sort of finished uh, this set of uh, this set of, which is about uh, predicting communication skill. We can look at a related problem, which is uh, presenting skills, teaching skills, uh, where we are looking at the TED talks, MOOC videos, as well as uh, classroom setting, right? We want to do uh, look at all these um, 
together three different settings classroom uh, a situation where the, uh, a, a person uh, can have uh, access to all possible modalities of uh, say communicating so you can move around uh, you can gesture you can show something on the uh, uh, slide you can write uh, and so on uh, maybe in a ted talk uh, it's it is usually uh, what do you say it's just a, a talk right you just uh, talk and uh, maybe you can move as well yes uh, right there are a few uh, differences in the uh, situations here in the classroom uh, we also uh, setting we also recorded the students themselves right which will come to uh, subsequently in mooc it is a uh, it is a what do you say it has some overlap with the classroom so you can the person can talk primarily sitting or not uh, much movement uh, at the same time you could have slides uh, which which also do the talk right so we wanted to look at uh, how say the topic uh, content and delivery uh, sort of affects uh, how somebody is perceived as a effective uh, effective uh, teacher right so we started uh, uh, to record uh, classrooms with uh, two cameras one facing uh, the students the other facing the uh, presenter right and uh, we we started analyzing uh, we started analyzing the uh, the uh, the the facial cues particularly the uh, head pose cues and so on we also uh, started to look at the presenter uh, alongside so i'll show you a video so this video uh, basically shows that how the state of the art is in terms of automatically uh, detecting a face of a person uh, getting the joint locations right eye po eye gaze right uh, head pose and so on right so you can do a very good job uh, which is also real time right so why these are important as i told you some of these behavior cues are important for us right so i forgot to show you this uh, particular uh, video so here there are some hallucinations as you can see we can also track people's uh, body right uh, in terms of body joint locations yes this is from the ted talk uh, so what we are doing so here you see uh, we have this concurrent uh, data synchronized data where you're tracking the uh, presenter their facial cues and so on also tracking uh, students so this is one example that is being shown here right uh, we also managed to do the analysis for the whole uh, audience right so so we can start to look in terms of uh, uh, what do you say micro activities micro events that are happening uh, thanks to this uh, data set and uh, just to make a point also uh, so sometimes you will uh, you will see uh, some misfirings and all that uh, so here right so this is something that uh, what do you say we have to we have to improve right uh, so there are uh, there are limitations of some of these models they are not perfect but you can do post processing and uh, overcome uh, some of these limitation if you are looking at uh, certain applications the next work uh, is uh, the inspiration is i mean when you think of teachers right we we think of maybe your english teacher uh, say you have written something and they go and correct uh, Uh, the words and sentences and so on and uh, you most of you must be familiar uh, with this thanks to all your uh, mobile apps and so on so this is uh, this is uh, something that we know what we want to uh, do is uh, suppose somebody writes instead of uh, this is uh, printed text suppose somebody writes a essay right uh, can we go ahead and uh, uh, recognize the characters and do a similar job like this like a how a english a teacher would say mark uh, the mistakes and uh, errors and so on and finally give a, a score for the essay right the, we think that this will be very uh, important uh, in terms of say going to uh, schools rural schools and so on i think uh, we think that this is a important uh, problem to solve and uh, of course we use uh, deep learning based methods to uh, solve this more of that later but i'll just show you some uh, snapshots of uh, what we are getting uh suppose you have a essay you cut out uh, one line uh and uh, this is the predicted label right and uh, the original uh is like this right so you have few mistakes here and there uh this is still without the what is called the language model so uh, this can be uh, improved but at a at a first glance this looks like a, a decent uh, result 
and uh, also we uh, went from a good scanner to a mobile phone based uh, scanner right so the loss in performance is not much right which is which is actually good news so uh, so we have managed to uh, what do you say uh, so i think uh, in terms of going to mobile is uh, is not a difficult problem what could be a a, a more challenging problem is uh, here we have uh, what what we did to collect this data set is we used the existing uh, sa uh, sa data set asked people to write uh, with some spacing on a white sheet of paper and so on so this is a slightly controlled uh, environment for our initial uh, study but later we can uh, make sure that this works in the wild also so that will be the future future goal okay so what next so we have looked at uh, communication skill presentation skill and so on uh, what can we uh, do further right so one thing where we sort of extended this line of work is to uh, look at uh, performance analysis right art and sport just initial uh, few works uh, one ms thesis uh, and then uh, the next question we are asking is okay now that we can understand how humans are communicating can we also think of communicating with uh, robots which is the human uh, robot human robot interaction right so on the performance analysis work uh, what we have uh, done is uh, the following so to begin with uh, recognize postures right in bharatnatyam uh, dance form uh, using depth cameras uh, then we also went ahead and uh, looked at uh, expertise right so this is the line of work we want to pursue not just recognize actions or postures but also how well somebody does a posture so that you can uh, understand how is the quality of the action right so then we also looked at uh, expressions right uh, emotions so this is the second line of work then we also looked at uh, photograph analysis towards characterizing photograph pic, uh, how well somebody uh, picture, i mean takes pictures so this is some work uh, we have done on that line where we can say okay this is a night mode uh, photograph we can recognize that uh, and uh, compared to compare comparing these two on, in terms of these attributes how well is say this photograph compared to say a good one uh, which is the which is the uh, outer one right so we can start to give some feedback for people some actionable feedback saying you can improve on this dimension you can improve on uh, this dimension and so on and we also are uh, looking at table tennis uh, video analysis i'll show some uh, videos on this right so this is uh, the first one which is the dancing uh, skill so uh, pooja venkatesh who happens to be a dancer herself so she uh, did this work as part of her uh, ms thesis so uh, she managed to uh, build this uh, good data set uh, where uh, she collected uh, videos of dancers showing different uh, postures and we also uh, try to come up with a, uh, a, a coding system of these uh, uh, postures and so on and the bottom line is uh, we managed to uh, extract uh, features from the joint angles and so on which helps us to predict what the action is the posture is in terms of the posture we saw before but we also uh, now uh, can uh, make a statement about is this person a, a good dancer or not with with say 75% Uh, accuracy right of that uh, order again uh, in terms of emotions and uh, expressions uh, we could we could use some automatic uh, uh, analysis uh, to get the expressions and the level of expression and so on and uh, what is yeah so what is interesting is uh, uh, in in both uh, both these studies is uh, we we found that in order to uh, find who is an expert there could be certain characteristic postures Uh, which tell you uh, make this person do this posture i can tell you whether that person is an expert or not similarly uh, even in the case of uh, expression disgust was a important uh, expression if somebody has to do disgust then they have to be really trained right so maybe happy and others you can you can do it uh, fairly easily so what is coming out is uh, like maybe a, a way in which suppose you want to assess uh, expertise you could have a, a prompting which says okay do ex disgust expression right things like that do you work So, so here uh, in the posture case so we have uh, the kinect gives you the joint locations so these are uh, what do you say uh, with, with that whatever you can do you can do uh, you have 3d joint locations can i get some numbers yeah we can get 
Yes. So, I mean, at this point, we can we can get 3D joint locations. With that, whatever angles you want to compute, we can compute. So again, uh, just to go very quickly on the uh, photograph part, right? So various types of photographs. Within that, uh, what features uh, are important, and then uh, you can you can start to give some feedback to uh, people, right? Uh, then let's go to the TT uh, video analysis, which is uh, in, in some sense similar to the dancing problem. You look at the posture, you can look at the hand, you can look at the ball, track them, and then make some statements. So Neha uh, did some work uh, on this, collaborating with Professor Ram uh, on this. So what the work involved was to predict what was the shot being played uh, and also make some statement about can we get some cues how well uh, somebody uh, plays a shot, right? So here you see the the person is being tracked, right, in terms of uh, joint uh, locations. You can look at the hand uh, also with, with the time. This is slow down a little bit, right? And uh, you can also track the ball. So here you see the ball is being uh, tracked continuously. So of course, uh, this is a, what do you say, we have collected the data set, some piece of work has gone in, but a lot more to be uh, done in terms of quantifying the expertise of a, a person. So to, uh, to take these type of work uh, forward, so one thing we are doing is uh, we are collaborating with two startups, uh, which are into assessment space, training space, uh, on the communication skill part, so that is uh, some progress uh, there uh, and uh, in the future so this is really uh, future we want to go in the direction of uh, say automatic talent uh, identification in schools so that is something that we want to do uh, feedback for improvement user studies we want to do uh, and also maybe a, a futuristic thought is to say okay uh, feedback is best delivered uh, using people if not uh, can we start to use some avatars or uh, robots right so here is the avatar here is a uh, robot and this is the direction in which we want to uh, go forward human robot uh, interaction right uh, in terms of technology uh, trend uh, you can see that um, what used to be uh, say industrial robots uh, no offense uh, such as just just uh, what you say to motivate uh, this work uh, what used to be industrial robot doesn't understand humans right uh, and focus more on physical navigation I think slowly uh, there's also a lot of effort uh, towards uh, towards uh, trying to have a human robot uh, interaction conversational uh, interaction right uh, Dan Bohus uh, and others uh, have been doing uh, good work Microsoft research on trying to build such a platform where you have uh, an agent which is communicating with say three people and then accomplishing a simple task like booking a taxi or a simple game and so on so what you need to do here is not just uh, track people know who they are and so on but you also have to have a, a conversation you need a virtual agent or a virtual robot so you have uh, not just behavior analysis but also behavior synthesis right so of course you have to do speech recognition dialogue management these technologies are maturing so I think this is going to be possible uh, more uh, in the future right so we have done some initial work uh, not much but initial work but uh, going forward we want to focus on this area more uh, in terms of architecture, as you can see, uh, you have to do behavior tracking, uh, behavior decision making. Uh, and so you have to do the behavior tracking, which is the usual stuff, right? But then you also have to output actions for the agent. So you might have to take some decisions saying, uh, finish nodding, right? Uh, speak now, uh, look at A and so on, right? So this is about generating behavior on the, uh, on the agent or the robot. Uh, you also have to do dialogue management to know what you have to speak, right? And of course, uh, it would be good to uh, look at human human interactions and learn uh, learn models from from those right so it will be uh, ideal to not just write some rules but have uh, learned models right so that is uh, that is for the future so so far i've talked about uh, skill assessment and feedback uh, and uh, human robot interaction uh, now we'll go on to talk about vision and its uh, applications right any questions uh, so far so in order to appreciate the vision work uh, I'll just give a, what do you say, a, a short segment on uh, visual recognition using machine learning, using deep learning, which I think is very important uh, to appreciate the kind of work that comes after. So let's do that. So 
what is the challenge, visual recognition challenge? You want to recognize uh, an object, say an aeroplane, and uh, you want to do it uh, with a lot of intra-class, a uh, lot of variation in appearance. So these are appearance variations, occlusion, uh, lighting, and so on. There is also intra-class variation. So you have different uh, types of aeroplanes, right? You want to capture uh, that also. And finally, say, yes, this is a uh, aeroplane. How, how do you do it? Uh, in the machine learning framework, you do it by uh, giving example images, uh, which define a category, right? And that's how you want to learn a model for recognizing, say, uh, cars or aeroplanes, right? And uh, typically, the framework looks like this. You have an image. You extract uh, features. The features uh, are engineered, right? You're usually, you have a domain uh, knowledge, uh, vision knowledge that you have uh, that is used to uh, extract, um, extract these uh, features. And uh, finally, you build a model, say a, a model which will classify a car versus non-cars, right? So that you can say, make a statement that this is a car, right? So what is, um, how, how do we uh, get these features, right? And the features, as you can see, uh, have to do a very important job, which is somehow uh, remove all the variations that are uh, there with uh, appearance uh, that can come, right? So how do you extract such features, right? So so the idea is the following, right? So you have, uh, and from an image, you, you extract what are called uh, invariant uh, descriptors, right? You detect some interest points, get some descriptors, do some uh, k-means clustering, grouping, and so on. Finally, what you manage to do is to capture this idea of a part, right? So you have aeroplanes, it has these uh, parts. And if you have a large data set uh, with various objects, you can, you can start to uh, get uh, the notion of parts being captured. Once you have the uh, parts, so you have this uh, visual vocabulary. So this is also called bag of visual words uh, representation. So once you have captured the notion of parts, then your job of modeling becomes simpler. You just represent an object, say, uh, a face using this representation. Say you have an object, a face has two eyes, one nose, and a mouth, right? So you can say, ah, this is a class of face, or like that for any other object. The limitation, of course, is it is uh, it doesn't know that this is actually not a face, right? So this representation has such a limitation. Those were addressed later. But the main point I want to make is the traditional way of looking at things was to uh, extract features in an engineered way and then have a model on top. Now what we should uh, do going forward is, is, is using deep learning uh, methods. So this whole deep learning uh, uh, area got uh, sort of enthused in vision in 2012 in speech around uh, 2010, 11 uh, types. So here, this was one important work by uh, Jeff uh, Hinton. So what did they do? Uh, they approached the same problem of object recognition using uh, deep learning methods. How does that work? Right. So before that, let's just uh, add a few more pieces uh, to the puzzle, which is in uh, 2009, uh, a data set was, into, uh, was created, collected, uh, whatever, which was based on uh, uh, WordNet, right? the ImageNet uh, database. It had 22,000 categories, right? And 15 million labeled images using Amazon uh, Mechanical Turk, which was very, uh, which is a very important uh, contribution. Then they started to run some challenges, right? ImageNet uh, challenge in 2010 onwards. It is running even till now, 2018, uh, 17 if I'm right. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, the challenge was a simpler challenge. So you see 1,000 uh, categories, not 22,000, 1,000 categories, and 1,000 images uh, in each category, uh, 1.2 uh, million uh, training images, right? So how people were doing uh, in 2010? In 2010, uh, around 2010, 11, these were the baselines, and these were closely related to the bag of words approach that I mentioned, right? So you see here the top one, top five uh, accuracies, what they mean. Uh, top five is if I predict uh, a label, uh, Say, uh, if I predict a certain label, is it, uh, is it in the, so if my top five predictions, is it there in the ground truth, right? Is it same as the ground truth? So that is the problem setting. If it is top one, you only predict one, right? And see whether it is correct or wrong. And what happened uh, in 2012, uh, the paper that I mentioned, they attempted this task, which is a 2010 task, right? And they just showed that they could bring down the accuracy uh, from 20, 8.2, 25.72, just 17%, uh, right? So there's a huge uh, 
uh, huge uh, drop in, in terms of uh, in so this is, these are error rates right so this is error so that's why you get a drop right otherwise you get a uh, increase so this was a huge uh, huge change in terms of uh, to begin with how the problem was approached and the accuracy that uh, people were getting right i'll complete this picture going forward there is a interesting uh, thing that happened after this also right so here uh, you see the results are quite good right uh, in terms of the top 5 uh, accuracies so in terms of what happened uh, why uh, why this architecture is uh, different from what, what used to be before right what used to be uh, before you can think of it as uh, as follows where you have uh, you have engineered some features and then engineered features are here and then you have a, a, a one layer or a two layer network which gives you a class label right this used to be the way things worked before whereas now we have uh, a deep neural network uh, in vision you will see that uh, the 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 neural networks are not looking like this they are looking more like this what they are doing is they are uh, taking a volume say rgb image and then you getting volumes and so on and how does this work how does this work so the the crucial change is the following so you have a volume which is rgb image now you have weights which are multiplying these uh, images right now these weights are also learned so this this starting from image to the next uh, next part this is the feature extraction process right the feature extraction process happens over multiple layers maybe towards the end it is modeling now you see that the weights are also learned whereas in a traditional setting you would have engineered weights right so that is the crucial uh, crucial difference that uh, we can see here right and the architecture that uh, this group uh, proposed uh, alexnet is is looking like this uh, so it's a deep architecture will not go into a lot of details here and uh, so this was also the time when uh, they managed to uh, so you have you have 60 million parameters right that's the main point so you need large data set to learn those parameters to store the parameters they resorted to having uh, two gpus right otherwise you can't do it uh, uh, solve this problem so you needed uh, two gpus and then there are some connections uh, in intermediate where the weights are being used and so on otherwise it's a separate uh, unit going on top and you see here uh, the weights that are being learned uh, in the first layers uh, because there are no cross connections you see somehow the top one is learning the black and white uh, monochrome uh, type of features whereas the color is being used in the uh, lower layer right so so what the the message is you can actually uh, we have a neural network you can actually feed back right you can do a feedback and learn the features also right that's the bottom line so uh, if you have enough data you can actually learn the features as well right and uh, so what happened after 2012 after 2012 uh, the community has pushed the limits even further and they have uh, gone to even better than human uh, accuracy right so this is the res network from uh, microsoft uh, already uh, google was got into the game and then microsoft research also got into the game and the game is now about deeper and deeper architectures so this particular architecture the resnet uh, is actually 152 uh, layer architecture and uh, what is shown here is just some 34 layer uh, just for visualization it has what is called skip connections and so on but the main point is yes the layers are getting uh, deeper and deeper and human performance has been beaten at least in this task right in in, a, in this particular setting so i don't want to get into war of words on that but uh, it is just uh, in this setting and uh, i'll show you later uh, some of the videos that we have uh, these uh, models fairly generalize as well so we show that it is actually working very well in uh, different situations so once the recognition problem is solved uh, the community focused on detection a problem which is given a image detect a uh, detect a person and so on later uh, segmentation right i'll show some results uh, for some of the images that we have so if somebody is wondering what is happening uh, under the hood right i thought i'll just uh, spend few slides to explain this but we can uh, do it later also so i think uh, i'll reserve this set of slides to later before we uh, sort of lose out of lose time
So let me show uh, a video, which is which is about. So this is El Cita uh, work with uh, El Cita, right? So we finally managed to detect detect objects. Uh, particularly, we were interested in five categories: bikes, cars, uh, buses. Right? And it is doing a fairly good job. Auto. We had to retrain. We have to create a new data set uh, for this, right? But then, once you have done it, uh, it is it is very good, right? So, very impressive uh, results that one can get uh, with these. Uh. Okay. So let me uh, move on to what we have done, right? So. Visual recognition using deep learning, very good, works well, right? Uh, we are trying to have some applications on top, a uh, little bit of novel architectures. Uh, we are, I mean, we have to ramp up on this part. We are, uh, I mean, uh, in terms of the assessment work, it is fairly advanced. Here we are just building up. And we are also uh, making sure that we develop code from scratch so that uh, in terms of commercial applications, uh, we, can, we can build applications. So, as I told you, um, three types of work, traffic analysis, right? Uh, rash driving. So this is some uh, pet problem which we want to look at. Can we detect rash drivers? Say you have a camera which is uh, on the car. Uh, do we know that this person is a rash driver by looking at, say, the lane changes or getting closer to objects, people, and so on, right? So this is something that uh, we had looked at. Uh, initially, we have to, uh, we are thinking of continuing this line of work. Uh, then. Uh, surveillance. Uh, so thanks to a project from uh, CARE DRDO, uh, which was about indoor uh, surveillance, right? We managed to do uh, quite a few things here. And uh, one of uh, uh, continuation of this work uh, we we published uh, recently, uh, which is using uh, structural RNN. I'll just briefly uh, briefly talk about it. So, and then finally the augmented reality uh, type of application. Which is not, uh, which is not in the, what do you say? If you just do visual recognition, you might not go uh, too far into augmented reality. You have to do uh, what is called reconstruction also. So towards reconstruction, I'll talk about it. Here we are talking about a jewel being uh, visualized, right? So we have done some initial work on depth uh, estimation also. So this was the project uh, from uh, Care, where you have to track people, uh, know whether it is a, a friend or a enemy uh, uniform, what they are wearing, what. Uh, weapons they have and so on, right? So I'll show you a couple of uh, videos. So one is about uh, activity, looking at there is somebody uh, doing an abnormal activity. Here you see a person is being detected, so a human is detected, uh, human is being tracked, uh, and then uh, objects are also, uh, you recognize objects and then uh, see whether there is an abnormal activity in terms of uh, movement. Uh, here, we could also uh, so here we are looking at sub activity. Uh, so looking at humans, revolver, and the AK-47, uh, right? And uh, you will see that the ground truth and the predictions are uh, fairly close, right? Of course, in this work, uh, there is a small assumption, which is the temporal segmentation is is, is manual; it's not uh, automatic. We are trying to uh, remove that. Uh, uh, condition also, but you see that the uh, sub activities are uh, fairly uh, well well uh, recognized, right? So image recognition. So this is video uh, and then activity, right? So that is a uh, that is a difference. So very quickly, I'll uh, just mention. So we collected a data set where you have activity, sub activity, uh, and also object affordances, whether it is stationary, moving, and so on. So we managed to uh, collect a data set for this and then extracted features uh, for human weapon and so on and then uh, tried to model uh, what happens uh, at the level of human, say what activity the person is doing, what uh, affordances the object uh, can afford to have. And uh, this was done using a, a, a structural uh, RNN, right? A structural RNN which was, uh, which was based on uh, 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 CRF model and so on. So uh, let me not go into the detail now. So let's move on. 
So what we have been also doing uh, in the surveillance uh, uh, type of work is we just extended it. Uh, Professor Srikant uh, uh, collaborates. I mean, he uh, he uh, got a data set for us from uh, Nimhan CCTV uh, camera. So I'm going to show some uh, images from there. So you, they shared some uh, videos with different uh, angles of CCTV uh, cameras. So here, what is being shown is that not only we are able to get detect the uh, person. So here, the goal was to just count people, uh, detect how many people are uh, there, and uh, we just uh, used one of an existing uh, pre-trained uh, model, which can also give the uh, segmentation. And this is what is the result without any extra work, right? So the models are so robust. I mean, we can see that maybe it will do some mistakes here and there, right? But then. Uh, in terms of getting a rough count of people, this is good enough, right? And uh, so the, the models are quite uh, general in that sense. For the LCTA uh, uh, object tracking, vehicle tracking, we had to uh, create our own data set. Additionally, we labeled some of the images for this with no extra uh, effort, right? So this is, so it is able to detect the cars, motorcycles, and and so on, right? So you can actually monitor uh, a region if you want. So we talked about all this already, surveillance. So the last piece of the puzzle is augmented uh, reality. Uh, 2D augmentation is fairly uh, easy, right? Where you can detect uh, detect parts of an object and start to pull, put a, a jewel on top of it. That is fairly easy, but uh, the challenging thing is to go to uh, 3D uh, augmented reality. I'll show a small video on uh, 2D uh, augmented reality. Before that, I have to mute this, otherwise it'll make a noise. Okay. So here you see the ears are being uh, detected, uh, and then uh, the jewel is being visualized, right? So this is this video is mainly to show that the a jewel can be uh, visualized. Uh, we also were playing with automatic and having a marker and so on. So here, this this is with a marker that you can see. So this is uh, right. So there are challenges, but broadly uh, you're able to visualize. So last couple of slides. So uh, visual recognition we talked about, right? where you have objects and you want to recognize what an object is. You can also uh, think of reorganization problem, which is uh, segmenting uh, object boundaries and so on. Uh, Professor Jitendra Malik, uh, so he, he proposes to look at computer vision as three different uh, sub-problems, but each one uh, feeding to each other or helping each other, right? So which is recognition, reconstruction, and uh, reorganization. Reconstruction is typically studied as multi-view geometry uh, uh, type of problem or uh, 3D scene reconstruction and so on. So this is some uh, area where we haven't ventured out uh, so much, but increasingly we see that in order to say uh, insert say an object uh, within a within a video and maybe make it go around or whatever. So you need to understand the 3D scene fairly well then you can start to insert objects, which is all about augmented reality. So we have looked at 2D, uh, but 3D not much. We are taking some initial steps to uh, look at depth estimation, uh, surface normal, uh, and so on, which are sub-problems you have to think of uh, when we uh, look at uh, using an image to predict uh, to get a 3D uh, view. So for depth estimation, this is one last piece of work, which I will just mention here. So this is by Ajay. Uh, which is of curriculum learning for depth estimation. So what are we doing? Uh, so we use graphics to generate uh, curriculum, right? As in, uh, so if you have, if you look at S1, uh, which is an empty room. So here you see an empty room, uh, room with some objects, and increasingly complexity is increasing. So we, we show that uh, in this work, if you just uh, use some existing images and train, say, a model, uh, or just use all of them uh, whatever we have generated, as well as some existing images and train a model. Compared to that, we can do better if you just start introducing a curriculum as an easy uh, and more complexity and so on. So uh, this work basically shows that uh, if you have a curriculum, 
uh, thanks to uh, graphics that you can generate such a, a set of uh, images, uh, then you can uh, actually have uh, better performance in terms of what you can do otherwise, right? That's the bottom line of this work. And some uh, results uh, in terms of inferred uh, depth and ground truth and so on, right? So I'll stop here. Uh, if you have any any questions. Some of the work you're looking for seems to be actually a confluence of work. That is, there is a statistical variability to be dealt with. Correct. But you also have to have models which capture the spectral aspects, like the some of the graphical models. Correct. So how far are these now? What sort of work is that? Is it Correct. like you saw already assumed that this, this confluence of aspects or is it more than that? Correct. I mean, from whatever little I see, uh, there are people who have, uh, what do you say, a background in uh, graphical models more who are trying to uh, I mean, trying to say that uh, if you use graphical models and uh, neural networks, you, the combination seem to do good. At the same time, I also see neural networks people uh, trying to come up with a neural network uh, based solution itself, which can solve the problem as equally as, uh, say, somebody trying to use graphical models. Uh, a case in point is action recognition. So you, you see the baselines or the, the best state-of-the-art methods. Uh, you have some which are graphical model based, uh, and there are also increasingly uh, neural network based solutions which are beating uh, them as well. So I, I'm not, uh, I think the jury is uh, still. Uh, if you look at the image recognition, the way the the, the glass ceiling has been broken, what you're saying. So what they call is uh, human parity recognition is already possible with image net. So on the image. And uh, this, this has led to the image captioning kind of possibility. We can say two graphics standing in front of a water. If you go towards the video captioning and you integrate the graphical model, which this guy, like what you told for the weapon description, you already have the ground truth running. Correct. How does the video captioning is possible? Because tomorrow, if you go towards the uh, video description, Correct. you want to create a surveillance camera which will give the running text. Correct. For a movie kind of analysis. Correct. I think uh, video captioning is already, uh, people are, have uh, shown results on uh, video captioning. The other one you said uh, is what? So basically, I mean, in surveillance camera, you want a description. You want Correct. annotation Correct. in terms of uh, linguistic description. Correct. Or a, or a movie, movie kind of analysis. Correct. Right. I mean, how far are I think uh, short, short video clips, uh, we, can, we can make statements on them. I'm not sure if uh, I've seen any works on, say, long videos and uh, long summaries, uh, I'm not sure. So the, the CAR project, the video, the weapon, Correct. You already, even though you had a very small description, Correct. if you compare it to the natural language generation, I Correct. think you can really have a running commentary of... Uh, Correct. 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 So Correct. You can have the same description. Correct. 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 And I think, uh, what do you say, one more point is, uh, so somehow the, uh, what do you say, the RNN, uh, which is actually a recursive way of... Uh, doing neural networks, right? That framework itself seemed to be uh, quite useful for uh, some of these uh, problems without going into structure. So if you, uh, so just pose it as a RNN uh, problem. Correct. So you may have to semantically introduce uh, the structure of the semantics of the word. And onto the very abstract uh, architectures that are available. Correct, right. correct. So that gap is, that so far semantic gap is still there. Correct, correct, correct. Yeah, long way to go, yes. How far away are we from discovering this guy? Because it's not only about this guy. This guy is as in uh, uh, deception. In the sense that uh, there are two kinds of problems. One kind of problem is that it is possible for me in a crowded way, somebody is coming in, I can say, I would say, person in the disguise, person of the actually is this. In this case, police would be very happy. Correct. The other one could be saying that if I give away a picture of somebody who is 18 years old and then say, how will this person look like when he's 81 years old? Correct, correct. Correct. I think there are, uh, there's active uh, groups which are pursuing uh, biometrics and spoofing. Research was doing something on this stuff, something like that. Correct. Still, it's a very active research in biometrics community to spoof, uh, how do you spoof uh, some of these uh, biometric models? And can you detect uh, people? 
in a large crowd and so on. Uh, probably the huge crowd. Uh-huh. Possible for me to have a uh-huh. that 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 describe what is this case and what is this actual image. Uh-huh. Say for example in a movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, feature person. Is it possible for me to label actors with respect to how they are being made up? Yes, I think uh, one has to look at the uh, what do you say face recognition or biometric on uh, there are data sets like that, but I don't know how far they have come to even what do you say uh, the person is quite disguised. Uh, how how well it does? Not sure. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. This can be done if you have a GPU machine. You can do it in real time. Yeah. Sort of extension of the question: uh, How close are we in terms of, you know, uh, being active? For example, how many things have we done? Uh, if we come back and trigger off an alarm, uh, will we end up having a lot of false positives, or uh, how sure are we that we are safe? Yeah. Yeah. I think what we have shown is uh, recognition type of results. So it's one thing to say automate even the temporal segmentation, start doing detection experiments. I mean, we have a, we just started, so there is a lot of experiments to be done to make sure that you get both, uh, uh, what do you say, uh, recall and precision uh, good. We haven't done those. Great uh, commentary. Uh, still, I mean, if they, if they Based on what is available today, you yeah. generate a commentary. It will look like uh, for each frame we generate a caption, and you, you, you string them all together to see uh, the But that uh, yeah. So it's, and the lot of the temporal associations that you need from one frame to another. Right? So, oh, so you, you notice something that happened uh, ten minutes ago. It's the same thing repeating. It's the same person reappearing or whatever, right? So those kind of temporal associations. Uh, it's very hard to yeah. So I just wanted to show uh, a work called uh, "Show, Attend, and Tell," right? So, which, which is a image captioning uh, work where you're, you're given an image, you can caption uh, these images automatically, right? Uh, using uh, data sets which are large, and here you also see that uh, the attention, which is a part of that network, right? It is. It is here, the attention is here, and uh, it is generating the word people, right? So in some sense, I mean, there has been uh, some progress, which is in terms of getting fairly realistic uh, image captions, and also trying to understand what is happening at this point in time. The, the network is looking at people and saying, uh, this looks like this, and maybe you can even uh, troubleshoot uh, saying, oh, if there is a mistake, where that mistake could have occurred, right? Here it says clock. And this looks like a uh, a clock, right? And 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 you can start to uh, troubleshoot uh, where you are uh, going wrong, for example, right? So uh, I would I would say uh, there are limitations, but the progress is also fairly uh, fairly good, uh, I would think. Which which we would not have. I mean, can we imagine that this can be done? I mean, what to me. The contribution the underlined word or the entire sentence? Sentence. Yes. So, give an image. It gives you a sentence. There are some mistakes here, which is maybe. Yes. So the contribution is entire sentence. So why did it tell the woman is throwing paper water in So from from the data set, whatever it has seen, uh, it is generating a sentence. Maybe there will be other sentences also. So this could be a top sentence. 
maybe there could be another sentence so you can you can generate many sentences correct correct but i mean the main uh, main module here is the uh, decoder decoder module right so the decoder uh, here uh, rnn architecture you 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 give a word uh, gets a output so re, re I mean pick the topmost word or whatever put it here so this is a decoder rnn uh, decoder right and then if you have say uh, something spoken in a different language uh, say this is french sentence right if you can encode it uh, into the uh, system by adding one more variable you can start to decode uh, sentence so this is the frame at this point it emits only words words <laughs> No, this once you. So you have data sets where you have image, you have the caption, say five captions. Yes. If I give a sentence, can I? Uh, correct. I have seen uh, a company who who are trying to do that. Uh, given a sentence, they ch generate a video for that situation. At the same time, uh, as Professor Raghavan was saying, uh, GANs uh, type of work, which is we can think of GANs for videos also. So you can generate videos, and you have some conditional input which will influence what it is generating also. People are doing some works yeah, like that. Yeah, there are some works like that, right? Po poetry and generation and all. So, I mean, the 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 semantics, syntax, all those seem to be captured, and you can also influence, as in, you can condition, saying, uh, translate this sentence or uh, for this image, generate an output. So somehow the the language uh, models the language aspect is also captured. Uh, you can influence it also. Thank you. Thanks for your attention.